We're going to transition now to our scripture. So you can take notes with us on the Bible app if you would like. Um, But we are going to be in the book of John in chapter 13. If you're able to, would you please stand as we read together? So we'll start um, chapter 13, starting in verse 31. When he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you. Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another." Lord, Simon Peter said to him, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can actually go ahead and remain standing as Pastor Lane comes up. Thank you so much, Pastor Ashley, and good morning, everyone. My name is Lane. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're actually going to begin our sermon today a little unorthodox, and I'm going to ask that you hang with me. We're going to do a prayer exercise, and this is a prayer of a prayer of uh, of song. And so, uh, how many of you did middle school choir, high school choir, college choir, anything? How many of you are utterly terrified right now? It's going to be fine, I promise, okay? But those of you who maybe are stronger singers, uh, help me out and sing out uh, loud and proud, okay? Um, And I had a choir teacher who said, loud and proud, wrong and strong. Just give me what you got. Um, So this, uh, the the word that we're going to sing uh, three times is just the word holy, just the word holy. And as we sing this word holy, um, try not to think too hard about how much you're singing, Uh, Just think about the holiness of our God and how it is the holiness of our God who brings us together to worship him this morning. And so we're going to start on the root note. I'm going to sing the phrase and you can repeat it back to me, okay? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Now we're going to go up a third. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Good. Now go up to the fifth. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Beautiful. Now pick one of those notes and we're going to sing the chord together. So holy, holy, holy. Okay. Holy, 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 one more time, holy, 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 amen, you can be seated. You did great, by the way. You are a beautiful choir. Psalm 133, verse 1 says, How delightfully good when brothers and sisters live together in harmony. Harmony is what we just did. We weren't all singing the same note, right? But together in our diversity we were able to create something so beautiful that we could not create if we were all doing the same thing, right? In this passage, Jesus says that the world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. On John, in John chapter 13, Jesus is basically on his deathbed, so to speak. And he tells them that this love that they have for one another will be their witness to the world. See, us knowing how to love one another in our differences 
is not simply a matter of being happy. It's not simply a matter of attaining some kind of inner peace. No, us being able to live in unity and love is actually intrinsic to our mission in the world. If we are not able to live in harmony together, we cannot be seen as people who love Jesus. It is our primary way that the world will see Jesus in us. If we can't love one another, the world won't see Jesus. They'll simply see another religion, another organization, another institution. And how many of you know that Jesus to us is so much more than those things? He is the love that binds us together. He is the love in which we live our lives. And this Greek word for love that Jesus uses this, in this passage is the word agape, right? This agape love is not the warm, fuzzy feelings that I experience when I like someone, No, agape love is about this this unconditional, self-giving, sacrificial, action-oriented love that allows me to seek your well-being even if I get nothing in return. That's what agape love is, and that's the kind of love that Christ has given to you and to me. When we love one another like that, that's when we begin to shine. That's when we become the light of the world. But this kind of love does not necessarily come naturally to us, does it? That's why a couple chapters later, Jesus tells his disciples that if you want to bear the fruit of the kingdom, you need to abide in me. You need to remain in my love, to obey my teachings, to allow my love to transform you so that the kind of fruit you bear is the kind of love that can only come from me. I am the vine, you are the branches but it is not often our first instinct to love people who rub us the wrong way, right? When I was writing this sermon, I said rub us the wrong way, and I thought of a couple other favorite phrases that I probably shouldn't say in a sermon. And then I was curious. So I said, hey, chat GPT, what are some... <laughs> By the way, I don't use chat GPT to write my sermons, just so you know. Um, it wouldn't be as funny as me. Um, I asked it, what are some other euphemisms for the rub me the wrong way? And it gave me a few that I heard before. Grind my gears, ruffle my feathers, get under my skin, push my buttons. You've heard these, right? Then there were some other ones that I thought were more creative that I've never heard before. One was uh, get my goat. Have you heard this one? Get my goat. I've never gotten a goat. I don't know what that means. Um, Boil my potatoes. (laughs) Uh, Tickle my angry bone. I don't like that one. Fry my fritters, that one's fun. Uh, Turn my crank the wrong way. I don't have a crank, I don't know what that means. Um, Oh, this is my favorite. Set my bacon on fire. (laughs) That guy really sets my bacon on fire. I've never heard humans use these phrases, but I guess that's what happened when you ask a, a robot. So, the point is, whatever your euphemism of choice is, all of us have these people, right, intrinsically, that it's a little harder for us to sacrificially love, right? It's a little unnatural for me to want to lay my life down for them in this way. And the point is that agape love in Jesus is this witness to the world and it doesn't depend on whether or not I like that person or I want to spend my vacation with them. No, I am called anyway to love them. Now this passage we just, we just read, there's a lot of profound things happening in it, but I want to focus on a couple of elements. And the first is uh, our love for one another as witness to the world. And the second is kind of a case study of Peter. Oh, Peter. I love Peter. I think it's interesting that Peter is the one to speak right after Jesus gets done saying this, right? He's, Jesus is telling his disciples that he must be glorified, right? And that his glory comes through the suffering on the cross. And he tells them, people are going to know you're my disciples by the way you love one another, the way that I have loved you. And Peter kind of misses him saying that. And Jesus is like, I have to go somewhere that you can't follow. And Peter kind of gets hung up on this, right? Jesus gives this really important speech. You must love one another. This is how they will know. This is the important thing. And Peter's like, wait, where are you going? How come I can't follow you there? No, 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 no. Anywhere you go, I'm going to go, Jesus, right? He's always well-intended, Peter, right? He's like Samwise Gamgee from Lord of the Rings, right? How many of you have seen The Fellowship of the Ring, right? Okay, remember the scene? If you haven't seen it, what are you doing? Um... Remember the scene where, where Frodo, he decides to leave the fellowship for the sake of the, for the fate of the world, right? So he's in a canoe, 
and he's, uh, he's traveling on this river, and uh, he sees Sam trying to chase after him, right? And he turns back and he says, go back, Sam. I'm going to Moldo alone, right? And then Sam, right, ever faithful, he's wading through the water. He's like, of course you are, and I'm coming with you, right? That impression was perfect, and you, you know it was. That's Peter. That's who he reminds me of, right? He's just devoted. He's devoted. He's sometimes misguided, but he loves Jesus, and he is loyal, and he's faithful, right? Peter says, wherever you're going, I'm going to go. He says, Jesus, I will never abandon you. I will lay my life down for you. And Jesus is like, you sure? You're going to lay your life down for me? Because I happen to know that before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times publicly. Peter talks big game, doesn't he? (laughs) Peter likes to project toughness. You know, Jesus gave him his name, Peter. His name is Simon, but he calls him Peter, which means rock or stone, which, you know, rocks are tough. Rocks are dependable. They're strong, but they're also not very flexible. They're not malleable. They're stubborn, right? Yes, he is the rock on which Jesus will build his church, but in order to become the kind of living stone that Jesus is looking for, Peter's going to need to be reformed, reshaped into the kind of rock that can be used to build his church. Until Peter is willing to submit himself to Jesus, even to to do things the way that Jesus would do it, not that he would want to do it, Jesus can't build his church with him. See, Peter doesn't like this idea that Jesus was going to have to suffer, that he was going to have to lay his life down. Peter wanted a conventionally triumphant Jesus to take over the Roman Empire. But that's not what Jesus was doing. And Peter just has a hard time understanding how this could be. Remember the the, the passage um, in Matthew where Jesus calls Peter Satan? Remember this? So in Matthew 16, in verse 21, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Again, Peter tends to miss some things. And Peter took him aside to rebuke him, to rebuke Jesus. And he says, never, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. Then Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. He wasn't interested in doing things God's way. He wanted to do it his way. And I remember when I was a kid reading that and being like, Satan, though? Like, that's a little intense, Jesus. He's just kind of looking out for you. you know? the, this word Satan actually comes from the Aramaic satanas, which means the accuser or one who stands opposed to God. So really what Jesus is not saying is you're the devil incarnate. What he's saying is you are standing in opposition to the will of God right now. You are aligning yourself against God in this moment, even though you have good intentions. This is not the way that I will be glorified. This is not the way that I'm going to save the world. You have human concerns in mind. You have human methods, human strategies in mind. But I'm playing a different game. Yes, Peter, you are the rock, but you're more of a rock that I'm tripping over right now. (laughs) Get out of the way. Peter isn't yet understanding that there is an upside-down nature to this gospel, that there is an upside-down dynamic to the gospel. He doesn't understand that you can't brute force his way into the kingdom. And this stubbornness of Peter's persists all the way to Jesus' death and even a little bit afterwards, right? In John chapter 18, a few chapters later, we see how um, uh, Peter responds when Jesus is arrested, right? So in in in, uh, um, John 18 and verse 8, Jesus says, I told you I am he, Jesus replied, so if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the words that he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? See, Peter was concerned with his own way of doing things, the conventional way. And I think it's funny, in the other synoptic gospels where we have the account of this story, they're like, yeah, there was a disciple there who cut off one of the ears. Yeah, one of the guys drew his sword. And John was like, it was Peter. And he cut off a guy's ear named Malchus. Go ask him. Like, he's still around, right? 
But he can't fathom that the way of the Father, that the way of the kingdom is surrender, is submission, is peace in the face of violence, is, is loving one's enemies who are actively seeking your demise. Peter cannot wrap his head around this. He's a rock, but he's one that needs to be remade. I love the words of the prophet Ezekiel. It says that God will remove the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. See, Peter, like so many of us, he struggles with his fear. Peter's afraid. How many of you know that sometimes the biggest bullies in the room are those who are the most wounded, who are trying to protect themselves? Peter gives a lot of bravado. He gives a lot of volume. He projects a lot of strength. But most of the time, this is a response of fear of insecurity. Peter has a really hard time with change (laughs) because change means insecurity. Change means a lack of stability. Change means I can't predict what's going to happen. Things need to stay the way they are because they work and that's what makes sense. (laughs) How many of you, as you get older, you kind of feel like that old person get off my lawn syndrome, like kind of rising up in you, right? Where it's like, why do you have to change things? I feel that in me all the time. And this is where Peter's life, I think, starts to get really relevant for us in this series. See, Peter, Peter's learning to love people, not the way he naturally wants to love, but the way Christ loves, whose love is far more generous and who he extends belonging to, far more generous, to all sorts of people in all sorts of ways from all sorts of life. See, there's this interesting dynamic in the New Testament around this idea of the Jews becoming Christians, right? The Jews recognize that, a lot of them do, that Jesus is this Messiah figure that they've been prophesying about in their scriptures. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. But there are also Gentiles who are coming to know this Messiah, the saving grace of Jesus. And they're having this debate in the faith community. They're like, okay, well, Jesus came from the Jews. He's the Jewish Messiah. So if you're going to have faith in Jesus, you first need to become culturally Jewish, Like, you need to start obeying the law of Moses. You need to start getting circumcised, which I'm sure a lot of adults were not stoked about, right? You need to obey the law of Moses. And there's this, a lot of Paul's letters are pointing to this idea that, listen, Jesus doesn't just belong to the Jews. He belongs to everyone. Jesus came from the Jews, but it was the gift the Jews' lineage brought to the world the saving grace that all have access to. So to be, for a Gentile to know the saving grace of Jesus, you don't have to become Jewish first. Jesus will come and meet you where you're at. And this is really tough for a lot of the Jews who had lived dedicated to the law and to the Torah. This was hard for them to reconcile that this was even possible, that these pagan people who yesterday were giving sacrifice to idols could all of a sudden jump in and be a part of our Christian community. This was hard for them. And we see Peter wrestling with this, right? Peter, he was like a mega Jew, right? He was a proud Jewish boy. I mean, even his dog was circumcised, right? And Peter, (laughs) it's a joke. (laughs) Um, He probably didn't have a dog. They were unclean. Anyway, so (laughs) Peter, he's wrestling with this. And he's in Acts chapter 10, he's on a rooftop and he's praying to God. And God comes to him. Jesus comes to him in a vision. And he lays out this big blanket, this picnic blanket, <laughs> full of all, these, all this, these animals, these unclean, non-Jewish approved animals. And Jesus says, kill and eat. And Peter's like, no. <laughs> I am a faithful Jew. I've never defiled my body with any of this, and I'm not going to start now. I can't, I can't do this. And then Jesus says, Do not declare unclean what I have made clean. Jesus was about something new in the world, extending a kind of grace that was more radical than Peter was understanding. So Peter comes to his senses, and eventually he ends up going to to be hosted by uh, this Roman official, Cornelius. And he eats with the pagans, the Gentiles who are unclean in order to share the gospel of Jesus. But even after that revelation, even after him going to Cornelius' house to share a meal with him, he still struggles with this. We see Paul actually call Peter out in one of his letters. The apostle Paul, who's the new kid on the block, he calls out Peter for his lack of, of, of understanding and living out of the grace of Jesus. In Galatians chapter 2, this is what Paul writes. 
But when Cephas, who's another name for Peter, he has three names, Cephas, Simon, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. I love that phrase. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men from James, a.k.a. Jewish people. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. There's that insecurity again. He feared those from the circumcision party. When the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, in quotes. And yet, because we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we ourselves have believed in Jesus Christ. See, Peter's stubborn. He's afraid. He's afraid of what people will think if he's associating with these Gentiles. Afraid of being misunderstood. You know, we give Peter a hard time, but how many of you know that a lot of us are more like Peter than we care to admit? Which is why I think he's such an important character in the Gospels. (laughs) We're supposed to see ourselves in Peter. Sometimes we are often more compelled by our fear of man than we are by the love of God. And here's what's amazing. Jesus knew that. (laughs) He wasn't surprised by that. Jesus knew who Peter was when he called him. You are a rock in every sense of the word. You are stubborn. You are unyielding. But you are also exactly the kind of person on whom I want to build my church. There is a grace for us. See, Peter is this incredible case study for us. Because even Peter, with all of his issues, when he would humble himself when he would allow the Spirit to move through him, he was, incapable, he was capable of incredible feats in the kingdom. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I want to take a look at Peter's life a little bit. I want to take a little turn on this sermon because his life journey towards learning to love everyone the way Jesus loved him is an interesting one because he does get there. He does get there, but he he struggles along the way. He's stubborn, right? The stubborn one who denied Jesus three times publicly is the same guy that when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him at Pentecost, he's preached to thousands of strangers and Jews about how Jesus was the fulfillment of everything in the Law and the Prophets and was coming for the world. Same guy. When Peter would submit himself to the heart of God, to the will of God, He was able to do things in Peter that Peter could not do apart from the Spirit. He was able to do that. And the same is true of you and me. I've often said that the kind of unity that the church needs in our nation in this current cultural moment is actually impossible. I really do think that unity for us is impossible. It would take a miracle. Oh, but guess what? We serve a God of miracles who through the Spirit is able to draw us together in ways that we could not without him. See, Peter, in Acts chapter 15, they gather this council at Jerusalem because they're debating this. Do the Christians need to become Jews first? Or the Gentiles need to become Jewish in order to be Christians? And they're debating and they're debating and they can't settle on something. And then finally, Peter stands up and he affirms the Gentiles. He says, friends, we know the gospel. No matter how much we may want to resist it, Jesus came for all of us. And he had to resist tooth and nail his instincts, right? Peter really, in his flesh, didn't want to be associated with non-Jews. He loved being Jewish. Perhaps he was embarrassed to be seen with Gentiles. But he found a unity with people who didn't adhere to the law of Moses even though it was difficult and unnatural for him. At this point, I want to ask you, who is it? Who's the person that if you were seen out in public having dinner with them, you would be embarrassed? That you wouldn't want to be seen associated with them? Who's the person that if another Christian that you respected knew that you were associating with them, they'd want to deny it? Where does your fear have a hold over the mission that God has for you to extend his grace to those around you. But friends, through the Spirit, 
we have the ability, like Peter, to rise above that fear in the flesh, to embrace the love of God. Friends, we need to invite the power of the Holy Spirit into our lives, into our relationships, especially when it comes to those who are really frustrating, especially with people who vote differently than we do, that person who has the bumper sticker that just gets your blood boiling, that family that lives in that house with all the wrong signs and flags on their lawn, the person who puts those posts on social media that just lights your bacon on fire, right? (laughs) We need to learn how to love those people. We need to learn how to rise above our fear and to embrace the love of God. I was recently in a workshop with Dr. Tammy Tammy Dunahue. She's the dean of uh, Portland Seminary. And she was referencing this this study, um, this book that was done by uh, Jim Wilder and Ray Wooldridge. And uh, the book is called Escaping Enemy Mode. And these are neurologists who are taking a look at kind of the neuroscience of um, the amygdala, right? So we'll give a, a little lesson here. So the amygdala, this is the part of the brain that's back here. It's responsible for that uh, flight, fight, or freeze response. We've heard of this, right? So when we get into a dangerous situation, we feel that we are being threatened or that, we, that harm might be near us, our amygdala triggers and it sends signals to the body to release, to release adrenaline and cortisol, these stress hormones. And when that happens, it's doing that so that we can have that fight, flight, or freeze response. Do we need to fight? Do we need to run? Do we need to hide in order to survive? And when this happens, it's really interesting. It's a really helpful tool. Like God designs our brains that way. And it's powerful that we, in a moment, our brain can take over in a way that can save our lives sometimes. It's, it's pretty cool. But when that happens, the average IQ will drop 15 points. <laughs> when we have an amygdala response, we literally get dumber. <laughs> we stop thinking reasonably and rationally. You ever been in a fight with someone, like an argument, and you start saying things, you're like, I, I know that I make sense in my head, right? And you're just trying to get something out, but you're not making sense. <laughs> this is your amygdala telling you that you are in danger even if you're not physically in danger. But how many of you know that one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control? That we are not ruled by our animal instincts and our fear. That we are called, as Paul says, to be renewed in our mind. To live into love. So much of even addiction therapy is learning how to get us from this instinctual behavior into our prefrontal cortex that controls our higher thinking. Friends, might I suggest that one of the best ways to do this is to pray, (laughs) to invite the Holy Spirit to say, God, I'm feeling fear right now. I read that post, that person said that thing, and I'm feeling my amygdala respond. I'm feeling that fight, flight, or freeze response I'm feeling fury come up in me, and I want to fight back. But I know that you have not called me to live by fear. That You've called me to love others, even when it is harmful to me. So help me, Lord, to be rational in this moment, to not allow fear to get the better of me. Help me, Holy Spirit, to move from fear to love in this interaction. Prayer is this wonderful way that we become all of a sudden mindful and conscious because the Spirit is with us, guiding our thinking. And I love that reconciliation, friends, with one another, this is so important. In fact, the reason why I bring up so much of Peter's life is because his fear often causes him to do things that he probably doesn't want to do, right? Jesus predicts that, hey, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And that's exactly what happens. People come to Peter and they say, hey, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? I I, I never knew him. I'm not not one of them. Three times this happens. And then what I love about this is that Jesus gives Peter not just forgiveness, but he gives him a moment to be reconciled to him. When he finds Peter on the shore, he gives Peter this exchange, right? Where he asks him, Simon Peter, do you... Love me? I'm going to read into the text a little bit. But Peter goes, yes, of course, Lord. 
You know that I love you. I, I allowed my fear to get the better of me back there. But you know I love you deep down. That was once. Simon Peter, do you, do you love me? <sighs> Lord, of course I love you. I was afraid and I denied you. And I'm sorry, you know that I love you. That was the second time. Simon Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know what happened. You saw it before I did it. You know I was afraid, but you know that in my heart, I love you. And he says, then feed my sheep. Peter didn't know it at that moment, but he was going to have to learn how to be this leader of the church who shepherded a very diverse group of people from Jew to Gentile and to the ends of the earth, that Peter, this one who was often struggling with his fear, would be the one to preach the love of God to the masses. Jesus gave him the ability to be reconciled. And in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul writes that Jesus has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation is not just a good idea that makes us feel better. Reconciliation is the mission God gave us. That the world is not holding, that God is not holding the world's sins against them, but offering forgiveness. And he invites us to do the same, to be reconciled to one another. This is our ministry. Friends, we are not always going to see eye to eye. We're not always going to get it right. We are sometimes going to have tension. Our sign of unity is not whether or not we have tension. Of course we will have tension. Our sign of, of unity and love is not whether or not we fight. Of course we're going to fight. Our sign of love and unity is how we reconcile. That we can admit, okay, my amygdala got the best of me back there. I wasn't thinking very clearly and I lashed out in fear. But I want you to know that I love you. This is reconciliation, friends. This is what God has called us to. I'm going to close with um, a framework that we use. We can wait to th throw that on the screen for just a second. But we call this the Mind the Gap framework. I use it in my staff trainings, um, in our staff trainings, because I found it really helpful. So I'll use it in a team setting, because that's how I'm used to using it. But we have kind of the optics and perception of something a situation, a circumstance, and then we have the circumstance itself, right? How many of you know that sometimes the perception of something does not match the reality, right? So let's say that someone's late for a meeting, okay? If someone's late for a meeting, you can go ahead and throw the, the graphic up now. I can put something in that gap. There's a gap between my perception of the situation and the reality, the actual circumstance. And if they're late, I can fill that gap with negative assumptions, with character assassination and with mistrust. Maybe another word for this could be fear. <laughs> I can fill it with that. Oh, they just don't care about my time. They're just lazy and irresponsible like they always are. I don't know that. There's a gap between what's happened and my perception of it, right? Who knows? Maybe they got a flat tire on their way to the meeting. Maybe they wanted to call me, let me know they were running late, but their phone died because their charger didn't work the night before. Maybe they had to deliver twins in a taxi. I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. But I can choose to lead with love and trust, which how many of you know in our culture is kind of a tall order. Rather than leading with mistrust and, and negative assumptions, I can learn to lead with generous assumptions, with trust and with love. And then as time goes on, if I find that this person is repeating a pattern of hurt, then I can address it. Then I can bring it up, and then we can reconcile. But if I'm leading with mistrust, this is always going to keep a barrier between you and me, where I'm always just going to assume the worst about you. When you said that thing, when you made that post, when you put that sticker on your car, I'm always going to assume something, rather than actually moving towards you in love to know you. Might I suggest that this is what Jesus is asking of us, to learn how to reconcile, to learn how to live in unity by the bond of the Spirit. I was reminded recently 
by a friend that when we take communion, we do so to remember what Christ has done. It's a remembering, but it's also a remembering. That when we take communion, we are declaring unity with the love of Christ. And we are declaring that in Christ, there is an unbreakable unity that we have with one another. That we literally become the body of Christ, who is undivided by the Spirit. So you can go ahead and take your communion elements out. And as we do so, we remember the radical grace that Jesus has extended to all of us. And we remember that by remembering, we come together to acknowledge a unity that we have in Jesus that transcends everything. Every political ideology, every walk of life, every preference. Jesus transcends all of that. So before we take this, these elements, I just want you to sit and to reflect. Sit and reflect. Who is it? During this election season, I forgot to tell this the name of the series at the beginning of all this. Citizens, remembering who we are during an election year. We are people who are citizens of a higher kingdom that is not left or right, but above. We are called to see the world differently. And that's really hard. It's really difficult. So as we navigate our relationships in this election season, as the ads get more and more adversarial, as the campaigns get more and more vicious and cutthroat, as the family reunions get more and more tense, how are we, as those who follow Christ, to love one another? We are to remember a unity that we have that is far beyond anything that we could have earthside. It is a heavenly unity. And when we take communion, we practice that. So who is it? We all have them. Who are the people that when you think about sharing heaven with them, it's hard for you to wrap your head around? That instinctually, you might not want to love. That to go out to dinner with them might embarrass you. Who are those people? Might I suggest that the Spirit might be empowering you to love even them, the way Christ loved even you. So just take a moment to reflect and pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. Fall afresh on us. Renew us, God, and speak to our hearts. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to all of his disciples, even the one who would betray him. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is my blood and a new covenant, a new covenant shed for you. When you drink of it, you do so declaring the Lord's death until he comes. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for the unity that you have given us through your spirit. Would you empower us, O God, to live this unity out in a faithful way? laying down our lives in the agape sacrificial love that you have given us in the spirit of fellowship, in the bond of love. In your name we pray, amen. All right, friends, we're gonna take a little bit of a shift in the service at this time. We have uh, an update and announcement for you. So I'm gonna invite Pastor Kate, our executive pastor, to come and join me on the platform.